Welcome to the Art of Liberty, the unauthorized radical libertarian podcast with George Donnelly and John Tyner. If you want to maximize your freedom in the real world today, this is the podcast for you. Today is Monday, June 24th, 2013, and our topic today is, Are Libertarians Too Selfish? How are you today, John? I am, to borrow your phrase, kicking ass. All right. That's good to hear. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great as well. Yeah, I I, uh, I spent the weekend just knocking out a ton of stuff around the house and then fully, completely reinstalled my computer and everything actually seems to be working on the first try. So I'm pretty excited. Uh, that, on, on Linux, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I was I was going to tell my wife because I have to reinstall Windows for her every once in a while. But on Linux, it's kind of nice because you just copy your home directory and your entire configuration is there. So if everything's that in place when you start it up, it all just kind of works, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, that is one nice aspect, the Linux. Well, which yeah. uh, which uh, distro are you running? I run Debian. Uh-huh, nice, nice. So uh, I know a lot of people like Ubuntu and stuff like that, but I like Debian because I like to get under the hood and play with it a little more. Because I think Ubuntu is based on Debian, but I think it hides a lot of that from you. Yeah, it's true. Although, if I think my favorite Linux is Gentoo. Oh, really? That one's even uh, more hardcore than Debian is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm always, I've always been like a FreeBSD guy, and yeah, you know, FreeBSD, you compile all your packages yourself and stuff. And so Gentoo is the one that most reminds me of FreeBSD. Yeah, I used to do that a long time ago. I used to compile everything myself, and then I was like, "This is a waste of my time." And <laughs> Debian seemed to be a happy medium that I could deal with. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I use Debian now too. Do I have my follow, servers. Do you follow Woot at all? Woot? The website? Yeah, the website. They do like one deal a day. They'll sell like one item every day. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that. I've heard of yeah, it. Yeah, so they sell t shirts in the last couple of days. They've been selling Orwellian themed shirts. Oh, nice. And, and they had one the other day, and I just bought, I forgot to buy it on the day off, so I had to pay an extra three bucks when I finally bought it last night. But it's the Statue of Liberty, and instead of holding the torch up, she's holding up the Eye of Sauron. <laughs> that is brilliant. That is yeah. brilliant. Yeah, oh, I, I awesome. like that. That is excellent. So, so yeah, they do a shirt every day, and it's like I think now it's up to like twelve bucks. At you know, if you buy it that day, but if you miss it, you can buy it for like fifteen bucks if you you know for as long as they have them, I guess. So that's w o o t dot com, and what what's the item called? So this one's just shirt dot woot. Um, that particular one was called Liberty. Some supervision required. Ah, excellent. I've seen a lot of those memes actually going around. You know, void where prohibited, not valid in all fifty states. Kind of, <laughs> kind of stuff lately. That's encouraging when it makes that that makes it kind of more into the mainstream. I mean, it's yeah, people are starting to recognize what's going on. It's still a joke. You know, you wonder how seriously they take it, but still. Yeah, well, it's like that. It's like that. That saying, you know, let's let's all just admit it. We've been reduced to re- re- reading each other's political views on bumper stickers. <laughs> hey, so we uh, a listener, David, wrote in with a response to uh, you may may or may not remember this. Your backpack dilemma from I think it was episode one or two. Yeah, that was a long time ago. So for, for those of our listeners who might not have heard that episode, can you uh, uh, just refresh us on the, the backpack dilemma that you had? Uh, yeah, basically I went to the gym and there's a bunch of lockers there, but I had brought a backpack and I didn't really need it in the locker. So I set my backpack up on top of the lockers and while I was working out, somebody opened their locker and one of the straps of my backpack fell in the way of the door. And when the person closed the door, they trapped my backpack there and I couldn't get my backpack back. <laughs> my backpack back. <laughs> um, and so my question was, what would I be justified in doing to get my backpack back? And I think I was arguing, um, or at least in my opinion, I would have been um, justified. Well, I guess I wasn't arguing because I, I was going to say I, I was going to break the locker, but I guess the locker doesn't bring, belong to that other guy. But I don't even remember what I was arguing. You, you were now. considering <laughs> you, you were strongly considering breaking the lock. Breaking the guy's oh, that, lock. That's right. The guy's lock, not the locker. Sorry. I'd actually pulled on the backpack when this happened for a little while, thinking if I pulled hard enough, I might be able to get it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that was my question. You're right. Was I going to be justified in breaking his lock? And I was saying I would be, although I'm not sure that was the best solution to that problem, especially considering that I was able to just take my stuff out of my backpack and wait for the guy to come back. Mm-hmm. So David writes, he says, I think the answer to John's backpack dilemma is provided by Murray Roth- Rothbard in The Ethics of Liberty. 
That is the idea of proportionality. In John's case, he is right that the user of the locker has aggressed against him, albeit probably unintentionally. But to cut the man's lock off is a disproportionate response. If there was no lock, he would be justifying in opening the locker to retrieve his backpack. But to destroy the lock? That moves beyond a reasonable response to an act of aggression. And you are right that it is a human issue. Libertarianism doesn't ever conflict with common human values. It is an expression of them. So what, what do you what, what do you think about that? Um I I would disagree well, I think the 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 that that rests on the word reasonable. You know, what I think mm -hmm. is reasonable may not may not be what somebody else thinks is reasonable. I hate that word because everybody's like, oh if we'd all just be reasonable, you know, all of our problems would go away kind of thing. <laughs> um Although, so in, uh, in this, know, in this, there is ahead. a standard. I mean, I think it, it you know, reasonable people <laughs> to not be too circular can work out, you know, what is reasonable, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I had this discussion with somebody, um, who was trying to talk about how the government, our government had gone out of control. And I said, you know what, look, I know three people and I consider them all to be reasonable. And mm -hmm. I guarantee you that the three of us would never come up with a, could never form a government that we would agree on. Mm -hmm. you know like one of you know i i you know i'm me looking for a stateless society and then i've got a friend who's hardcore left and another one who's hardcore right and i was like if you put the three of us in a room you're not going to get us to agree on a government i guarantee it well the thing is the, you know i would argue that the concept of a government itself is inherently unreasonable so that that's, but that's that my, doesn't but that's threaten, my point yeah but that doesn't threaten the reason the idea of reasonability as a standard yeah, I guess all I'm saying, well, I don't think reasonability is a standard, or at least not an objective one. Well, so no, it, but it, they it, actually use it in, in the law. I mean, you know, you see that peppered throughout the law, you know, I mean, whether you like, you know, whether you consider that valid law or invalid law, it's peppered all throughout it. You know, it's a, a general standard now. Right, but I don't think it means anything. I mean, the government will tell you they think it's reasonable to take away your gun rights, and you may disagree. You know, it's... It's reasonable well, isn't some kind of objective standard. It's whatever however, people it is decide reasonable. upon. It is reasonable to limit uh, gun rights. It's just a matter of who's doing the limiting. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> just turn yeah, that around like, on you. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I mean, <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I don't. It's reasonable for some private property owner to tell people, hey, you can or can't have guns here, I suppose. Well, for example, um, in your homeowners association situation, uh, in a stateless society, they could decide that they don't want anybody open carrying. And Actually, my homeowners association has done that. I mean, the, okay. the laws of California are stricter, but ours has even gone so far as to outlaw um, pellet guns and air rifles. Okay. There, there's, that's a prime example. and. Uh, and that's not government law. That's uh, decided, you know, everybody entered into that homeowners association uh, voluntarily and anybody can leave. I mean, that's a prime example of, um, you know, rudimentary uh, stateless society kind of organization there. Yeah, I think you could argue, though, that restricting air rifles is not reasonable. I mean, we all abide by it because that's what we agreed to when we bought into the homeowners association. But there's plenty of people who disagree about what the rules should say. But they haven't overturned it, right? Well, I would argue too that there's a lot of apathy, and I mean, it's, uh, it's a, well, homeowners it, associations are, are interesting on a small scale because they're basically a government. But if it was sufficiently unreasonable, they would they would overturn it. I'm sure. Well, I think a lot of people just don't care. They've got better things to deal with. Ah, uh, well, yeah. So it's not not that unreasonable. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I think. It, but that's kind of my point is there's still, there's there's varying levels of unreasonableness. Like I think that this thing is unreasonable, but I don't, you know, I don't have to deal with it on a daily basis. I don't I don't particularly want to carry my air rifle around. You know, it's there's nothing for me to do there. I mean, what am I going to shoot at in the small common areas there are? Mhm. Mm so, I so think it the sounds rule totally is totally I think the rule is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let this go, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Got to we got to amp up the drama for our listeners. <laughs> so ba back to the backpack problem. Yes, uh -huh. um, I I would agree in this particular case that cutting the guy's lock just didn't make sense because, especially for the reason that, like I said, I didn't absolutely need to have my backpack back. But I'm not sure. I got to stop saying that. Um, I'm not sure that 
if that guy hauled me into court, I mean, it may, I don't know. I can't speak for what other people would find out, but it seems to me that guy aggressed against my property, which the, your listener seems to agree with. Mm. And I would be fully within my rights to get my property back. And in that situation, assuming I couldn't wait, um, the cutting the guy's lock would be the least drastic response. Hmm. If I wanted it back right then, that is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough situation. I know I would be pretty irritated if somebody did that to me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, ripping apart the locker, I think, would be not proportional. You know, I think the, like I said, the the least the least damaging thing or the, the least, I can't think of the word I want, um, but the least drastic response would be to remove the guy's lock. I mean, it only damages his property, not the locker or anything else around it. Although that could lead, like, if let's say if you you removed the lock, you got your backpack, and then you left the locker there unprotected. Uh, you know, who knows what he what valuables he might have inside there, and they could be they could be stolen. I suppose. Do I become responsible for them though? Well, that's a good question. For example, uh, this this reminds me of something a little bit silly. But when I when I was a boy, about seven or eight years old, I was traveling on a bus with my mother. We were in Butte, Montana, and I put a quarter in uh, into this uh, newspaper box, one of these old newspaper boxes, and I opened it up and I pulled out two newspapers because I okay. I, I thought that's because they my mother asked me for two newspapers, uh, so I brought the two newspapers back. And gave her one of the quarters back that she had given me, you know, and she's like, hey, you, you stole one of the newspapers, go put, you know, and so I was like, okay. You can get as many as you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I put my, I put the other quarter in the machine and I'm like, okay, I shouldn't take any more. I guess I'm good to go. But what that did was that left the machine open. So these right. kids who had been watching came over, they took advantage of that. They opened the machine. They took out all the newspapers and they went around selling them <laughs> to people. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. You know, to my seven or eight-year-old self, I felt like, oh, no. I just, you know, I just was like an accomplice in this theft of like 15 or 20 newspapers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. I don't think you committed a crime. I mean, those kids are the ones who stole the newspapers. And yet I was a little bit uh, careless. I mean – Right. Yeah. I mean, you, I, I enabled yeah, I mean, them to do that. Sure. And I could certainly see that. I mean, I, I don't know. In my opinion, the law can't make you responsible for that. I mean, you made it easier for somebody to commit a crime, but you didn't help them commit it. You know, although on a moral level, you know. Sure. But that's that's kind of the point. And I think even Rothbard goes into that um, in The Ethics of Liberty. It's been a while since I've read it, but he spends a fair amount of time talking about the difference between what's moral and what's legal. Mm -hmm. right. So morally, perhaps you might be responsible for enabling that theft, but I don't think legally you can be held responsible. At least right. not in my opinion. Yeah. Hey, so I also have a comment here on Twitter from an old friend of mine, Jim Tarpy. Uh, his uh, Twitter name is Jim underscore Tarpy, T-A-R-P-E-Y. Uh, he tweets interesting things, especially for um, tech folks and uh, people who aren't as anarchist as we are. <laughs> <laughs> and he wants to know, uh, hey, have you heard about the standing man, uh, John? I have not. So he says, curious about your thoughts on the standing man in Turkey. Could this type of protest be effective? So basically what the standing man did, I don't know if you're familiar with all the stuff that's been going on in Turkey. A little bit. So basically Turkey's been having its own kind of version of, um, you know, the, the Arab Spring uh, there was a park, uh, like the last remaining green space in uh, the capital, Turkey, I guess it was, mm -hmm. that uh, they were planning to demolish and replace with concrete and steel or something. And so the people yeah. kind of coalesced around that to stop that. And then basically the police just went insanely insane, you know, started killing people, pepper spray, spraying. I mean, everything out, just totally out of control. And well, so and I think that. That was enabled by the government, wasn't it? I mean, like the the head of Turkey actually came out and said, "We've had it with these people." Uh, yeah, it, that happened after after the the you know the inciting incident, um, oh, okay. so to speak. Yeah, and like I said, I've I've only kind of heard of little bits and pieces here and there. And so then, you know, you know, tens of thousands of people started coming out to support these folks, and now it's become a. Um, you know, a broad coalition of resistance to the government, uh, not so different from what happened in uh, Egypt. 
So any, anyway, there are, they've been doing a bunch of different things. But one thing that uh, this man did was he just stood and was completely quiet and still and um, may have been looking at uh, some image or painting or billboard. I don't know what it was. And he just stood there and all kinds of people joined him and just stood next to him. And everybody just stood quietly and peacefully and they held their ground even though the police wanted them out of there. And um, eventually, of course, the the police came in and, um, you know, really were brutal, of course. You know, what else can you expect? That's what they do. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's – so Jim's question is, you know, is it – do I think that can be effective? And I think that, uh, you know, basically what they did was they they, they, they grabbed some ground and they, they stayed there and they didn't use force of arms to do it. And so I thought that was very admirable, and it can definitely be effective because, um, you know, you're showing that you're not doing anything to incite the the police violence. And so it can be very good at showing just how out of control uh, the police are and showing that this is really a, a David and Goliath uh, kind of situation. Yeah, I think I think to the extent that doing that brings more people on board, I think it's a good thing. But I I deal with plenty of people or, you know, at least read their writings who think, well, these people are standing on private property or government property or whatever. And the police have every right to remove them with whatever means by whatever means necessary. (laughs) So, I mean, those people you're just not ever going to reach, in my opinion. Those those guys, I, I, I guess those guys are members of the, uh, you know, if a three-month-old baby crawls across my property line, I'm getting my shotgun and I'm going <laughs> to kill it, you know. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's. I think it's just a it, – if those people are on the other side of the political spectrum from them, then – They'll justify that by whatever means necessary. Like I said, oh, well, they're in this public space and they're denying the use of this public space to other people. And so the government should get them out of there. (laughs) You know, that was kind of the conservative response to the Occupy movement that I saw. Mm. You know, even though they're... Uh, even we don't care hundred thousand of them, I guess. Right. We don't care what these people's concern is. You know, it's well. I mean, they do, but they they basically disagree with them, and they're like, you know, hey, they're out, they're blocking traffic, they're in a public park, they're doing these things, and rather than actually hear their concerns and evaluate those on the merits, let's just focus on the fact that they're they're breaking the law to express their concerns and address that problem and just get rid of them. <laughs> So I guess if they had been in charge, uh, say, 50 uh, or 60, yeah, 60 years ago, 50, 60 years ago, they would have just mo- – they wouldn't have used water cannons on the uh, folks in, um, you know, Birmingham, Alabama or, or you know, around there uh, who were uh, demanding equal rights. They just would have mowed them down. They would have been like, hey, you're blocking the street. Uh, that justifies me killing you. Pop, 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 well, pop. maybe by whatever means necessary is a little too strong a phrase, but <laughs> – uh-huh. I think they I think I think these are the very people who were blowing those people away with water canyons or water cannons. Yeah. What a shame. I mean so, I think I think the idea that the government goes out and just starts shooting people, I mean that's that's kind of an open signal, hey, tyranny has arrived. You know, <laughs> at least with you if you do it with water canyons, people are like, Well, at least they're not killing them. Maybe. Yeah. Well they are getting a free bath. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. If you go out there with guns and just start killing people, that's that's a signal that the government's out of control and tyranny has definitely arrived. Yeah. So they, they at least don't go. They step one step back. Yeah. So let's uh, let's transition into peaceful parenting, shall we? Okay. So, so the, you want to talk about this Walter Block video that I saw last week and sent to you? Yeah. But first, uh, I just want to take a quick moment to kind of inoculate our audience against uh, a little bit of his nonsense <laughs> by talking <laughs> okay. about peaceful parenting. So I came across uh, – I don't know if it, how many of our um, listeners have heard of peaceful parenting, parenting, but I have a really short little thing about what it means to be a peaceful parent. Basically, we take responsibility for regulating our own emotions so we can stay as calm as possible with our children. We set limits with empathy. We reflect before we react, looking for the reason behind our child's behavior. We connect before we correct. We try to accept our child's big emotions with compassion, which helps her to move past them. We take responsibility for keeping our own love cups full so we can pour our appreciation, acceptance, and unconditional love. 
into our child. Now that 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 resonates with me. What what about you? No, it does with me too. I think I think that listening to that points out to me a number of flaws in my parenting skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's perfect. I mean, I when I read these things, I'm also kind of like, you know, geez, look, you know, look at this this gap between what I actually do and what I could be doing, you know. And uh, yeah, just just doing these these podcasts with you has has opened up my eyes hugely, and and I think helped me take a number of steps forward in the way I deal with my kids. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Like I, you know, my kids like to go into the into the bathroom across the hall from my quasi office here, and they just turn the water on and they make a huge mess in there. <laughs> and the first couple times they did it, I just lost it with them. I'd be like, "What are you? You know, I go in there yelling at them. What are you doing? You're making this huge mess. You know, I got super mad at them. Um, and then we've been talking about this stuff, and so they've gone in there since then, and. I don't get so mad about it anymore. You know, I kind of had to step back and be like, you know, they don't understand that they're yeah. making a mess. They don't understand it destroys stuff. They're just having a good time. And so I've tried to kind of look at it from that perspective, you know, and just go in there and tell them, hey, look, you're making a giant mess. You need to cut this out. Now you can help me clean it up. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, at least I'm not going in there yelling at them anymore and, you know, shipping them both off to their rooms while I clean it up, you know, <laughs> mad at them by myself kind of thing. <laughs> You know, I, I've had a similar situation here uh, with Clark, with my son. He he goes in to wash his hands, and for some reason, he wets his hands thoroughly before getting the soap. And so he wets his hands thoroughly, and then he moves his hands outside of the actual sink area to get the soap. And so he's dripping water all over the place. Mm -hmm. Then he gets the soap, and he soaps his hands up, uh, and that can go <laughs> just about anywhere. And then, and then he rinses them off, and then he has to reach again for the towel. And meanwhile, his hands, you know, are just dr dripping. I mean, right. big glups of water. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, his his mom basically freaks out over that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I totally hear you there. But yeah, that stuff's good. And I, and you'd sent me unconditional parenting, and it was funny when it arrived in the email. The the PDF you sent me was actually kind of small. I I thought. And I was like, oh, great. This thing's going to be like a 20-page pamphlet that I can tear through in like an hour. And so I opened it up right away, and I looked, and it was like 247 pages. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> it's an easy read, though. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm sure. It just it looked so daunting at the time. I just haven't started with it even. I was so deflated from the, oh, this is going to be a 20-page pamphlet that I can learn all about parenting right away. <laughs> Yeah, and for our listeners, uh, Uncondition Unconditional Parenting by Alfie Cohn. Uh, it's really good. Highly recommend it. Yeah, it certainly changed the way I think about parenting in a big way. Yeah, I, I, I'm really interested in reading it. Like I said, I just haven't, I haven't been able to start doing it yet or bring myself to start it just because it seems so daunting now to me. Yeah. And so just to, to give our audience a little bit of yellow journalism and, you know, give us a break, you know, so we have an easy target today. We have a video that John found with uh, Mike Shanklin interviewing uh, Walter Block about kids. <laughs> For anybody who knows Walter Block, you'll know just how insane this could be, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, 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 what caught your attention about the video? I was, gonna, I, was wait, I was waiting. I wasn't sure if you had audio set up or if you just wanted to jump into talking about this. Oh, yeah. Um, um... It's no, it's not a big deal. I mean, the yeah. interview goes on for like 10 minutes. I'm not sure we could play everything. So if it's not queued up, then no big deal. But yeah, the thing that caught my attention was when he, I mean, he endorsed spanking, which like I've, I've said before, I'm, I try not to spank my, well, I don't spank my kids. Um, but I don't necessarily have a problem with people who do. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's because I was spanked as a child and I'm just kind of used to it or what have you, but he actually went so far to say that kids don't have the same rights as adults. Um, and that the non-aggression principle doesn't apply to them. Yeah, that that was the he said that early in the video too, and that was the moment where I was um, just kind of freaking out. Uh, yeah, and you know, so and he kind of he kind of went on to I kind of agreed with him later on when and he I think he was making the opposite point, but he was saying that timeout is a use of force against them, uh, which I think was something that Kinsella and Molyneux were saying um, in that video that we talked about a few episodes back. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and yeah. then he, and then he kind of and then he kind of goes on well i guess we can get to this next thing later on or in a few minutes here but yeah that was he was i think he was making the point you know hey if you send your kids for timeout you're already 
um, applying force to them. So spanking is okay. I mean, that's, it seemed to me, he didn't say it in that way, but that seemed like that was kind of the point he was making. You know, he was basically saying, you know, you're already using force against your kids. So So, I don't know why you're against, why are you against spanking if you're not against timeouts kind of thing? So go ahead and use it in an unlimited way. You've, you've broken the levy, you know, the dike has, is not plugged. So, so just go for it. I didn't hear him say that, but I I suppose you could read that into what he was saying. Yeah, th- this whole thing that the the non-aggression principle doesn't apply to children. Um, I, I don't, you know, there are a few different ways you can look at this. One way is, you know, can he actually build a reasoned case for why uh, children are not worthy or their their nature is not such that um, that it makes sense for them to have that? Uh, and then there's another one, another sense of, um, you know, should we extend it, you know, uh, manually extend it to kids. And, um, you know, I didn't, I think if he had a case to make as to whether, uh, you know, as to some logical reason why it doesn't apply to children, I think he would have made that, but he didn't. And then if, if it's a question of, you know, like if you could think of the constitution, sometimes you say there's a debate about whether it applies to people who are not United States citizens. And some people say, well, it doesn't. And some people say, well, we should, you know, extend those protections to those people, you know, we should like pretend. And so, uh-huh. uh, either way, you know, if he, either way, if he can't, if he can't make a reasoned case to back up his opinion, or if he simply chooses not to extend those protections to children, um, I think either way, it's uh, completely bankrupt his, his approach to this. Yeah, and I think I think um, Rothbard kind of makes this case in the Ethics of Liberty. Like I said, it's been a while since I've read that, but he, you know, one of the things I've never understood is the parent-child relationship in the legal sense under libertarianism. And Rothbard kind of describes it as sort of a trustee relationship, where the parent doesn't own the child, but is basically in charge of the child. Um, and I can't remember if it's in the same section or a later one, but he also talks about, you know, why don't animals have the same rights that, that humans do? And he basically, you know, and the question is, well, how do you know when the child's old enough that he has these rights? And the answer was basically when he's, when he understands that he has them and asks for them, Mm. um, which like, again, I don't really understand mostly because it, I don't. I believe in the non-aggression principle against your kids as well. I mean, they're little people, you know, like we talked about in that episode with David Freeman, I think he was the phrase, they're little people who just don't know very much. Yes. Uh-huh. That's how I see it. Um, I think children are, you know, I mean, you know, whether you want to believe that they have it or not, or they deserve it or not, the bottom line is if you don't give it to them, uh, you know, if you don't act like they deserve it, the respect from it, then how do you expect that they're ever going to grow up to expect that from anybody else or to give it that kind of respect to anybody else? Uh, yeah, you know, and I think that's the point. Yeah. Or so that's the best argument for this. Childhood is just one long learning experience. I mean, the learning doesn't just happen in the classroom or uh, when you have an unschooling session or when you visit a museum. I mean, that that's not even the most important learning. The most important learning is what happens uh, you know, on between the lines, you know, when you're dealing with your child, um, you know, if I, if I treat my child like he's a second class citizen, well, then the lesson he's going to learn is I'm a second class citizen and it's okay to treat people like that. And if I treat him like a first class citizen in charge of his own life, a sovereign, then he's going to learn to be that way. And he's going to learn to treat other kids that way as well. Right. Yeah. You know, um, well, I'm going to try and move us along a little bit here, um, but he goes on and he describes um, protecting your kids from running into traffic is technically a, a use of force against them as well. Um, and I thought that was interesting because I, I think he's right. But the question I was going to ask is if you haul in the perpetrator of this use of force into court, would the court convict him? Like, could you get a jury to convict somebody for pulling somebody out of traffic? Hmm. Probably not, and uh, and for good reason because um, that I I I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think he's correct. That is defensive, a defensive use of force, um, you know, on the part of a loved one. Uh, you know, it's 
um, you know, defensive well, so, use of force on the part of another party is totally valid. Right. I agree. But I think he was, I think he started out at least by saying, let's say there's some, you know, adult person who runs out into traffic for whatever reason and you go grab him and drag him back. I mean, say he ran out into traffic on purpose and you just went out and grabbed him being a good Samaritan, not knowing what he was doing. Defensive so use of force. Right. So, I, so, well, I mean, it doesn't make sense for somebody to try to kill themselves. That's just, that's kind of insane. Well, and the person may not people, be There's full. people who do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they have the right to do it. But, you know, in that situation, you know, you don't know if the person is drunk uh, in full capacity, you know, full control of their mental capacity. If they're on drugs, you know, you don't know what's going on. And so I, did, I would feel totally justified in taking action to defend the person um even from his own um you know uh mistake i mean yeah, that so kind of a I, situation so yeah i get where i was eventually going with this is i don't think you'd be able to get a court to convict on that even if even if the guy who ran out into traffic was found totally mentally competent and he just wanted to go out he was done and he wanted to kill himself and you went and saved him against his will I doubt you'd find a jury who would convict him. Well, also, you could look at it from another point of view. You could look at this person who's going out in the traffic as the aggressor and the drivers as the people that, um, you know, you would be defending. Because if somebody runs out into traffic, uh, they could cause any number of different kinds of accidents or property damage that could lead to even greater damage to uh, life and limb. And yeah, so, I, you know, it's not so different from when uh, a, a man goes out onto a uh, train line and stands in front of a train. Um, you know, that that can that can damage the train, too. Yeah. So <laughs> so where I was where I was eventually trying to get to is, do you think you could get a jury of 12 people to convict this parent or Walter Block in this case of spanking his kids? Spanking his kids, not in today's climate, but um so, so I guess that was kind of my question. And then if you can't get a jury to convict, is it really illegal then? Is it illegal? Well, I, I, mean, I don't I really like illegal. the it's... legality as, as, you know, like my my personal framework is um, like way above legality. Frankly. Right. It's moral, not legal, right? Yeah. 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 I, 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 find, I find the moral versus legal just to be kind of an interesting area of discussion just because so many – there, that line seems to be blurred in the current society. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's like, well, this is wrong and we should make it illegal. <laughs> and so, you know, everything that, that people believe is immoral becomes illegal, you know, doing yeah. drugs, prostitution, all that kind of stuff. Right. Right. So, so that was just, kind of, that was kind of just where I was going though, is, you know, if, if the court's not going to convict for spanking, yeah, maybe it's immoral, but you know, it's not illegal. So there you've got a case where, you know, well, the non-aggression principle doesn't apply to kids. You know, if you can find enough people who believe that way, then. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, I think the non-aggression principle is outside of law as well. I mean, people can commit uh, an act of aggression, but um, not be convicted, you know, for any number of reasons in a court of yeah. law, you know. I happen to agree with you on that point. I just thought it was an interesting, an interesting way to look at that. Mm. But I think I think children do have um, rights, basically the same as adults, um, because basically our rights, you know, if we're going to uh, buy the Ayn, Ayn Rand explanation, uh, our rights come from our nature, and our nature demands that um, you know we uh, feed, clothe, and uh, house ourselves, and that you know we continually evolve and store value and. Um, and, um, you know, sustain our lives and, uh, kids, you know, want to live. I mean, they're all, they all want to live. Uh, you know, I, most of them, at least I know the ones that I know do, uh, they've made that choice. I mean, it's pretty obvious and, uh, and they, they have to take steps to, to continue, uh, living. And that's basically where rights spring from, because if I have, uh, if I want to continue living and that's my choice, then I have a right to my life to protect that. And, um, you know, if I'm going to continue eating and whatnot to su sustain my life, then I have the right to liberty to go out and, and get that food and whatnot. And um, so kids are just like us. I mean, they, they have the same nature we do. I mean, they're not uh, caterpillars that uh, change into butterflies later. I mean, you know. <laughs> Yeah, they they just bump along, and then one day they're fully formed adults. Yeah, I mean, 
So, um, and I think Bloch is a little bit disingenuous because he characterizes his opposition as saying that you can't use any violence at all against children. I, I don't know. Do you listen to Molyneux? Is this something that, that he has said? Uh, no, I don't listen to Mo- Not a lot. I just, you know, I don't listen to Molyneux on a regular basis now. Yeah. Um, it's possible that he that he said that. But I, I wouldn't say that um, you can't use any violence at all against children. And so, but but that's something that Block seems to, that, that he's saying that his opponents are, are saying. And that's straw man. Essentially, um, for example, my son sometimes um, is gets a little upset with me for whatever reason, and sometimes yeah. you know starts to push me or whatever. And so um, you know I'm justified, I think, in using just the tiniest bit of defensive force to get him to stop pushing me. Uh, well, we just described how you can prevent your kid from running out into traffic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't spank my son or anything. I just like kind of grab his arm and redirect his energy. I mean, he doesn't get hurt or anything. It's, it's like sure. a keto thing. Um, but in that, but I, you know, yeah. And also, yeah, to, to, I mean, if he's, he is not really caught, uh, conscious yet of the risk of cars in the street. And so sometimes he's running out into the street a little bit and I'm like, Hey, get back here, you know, and I may go over and grab his hand and, uh, and, you know, gently pull him back to the sidewalk. Right. Uh, yeah, so I think defensive violence, as always, I mean, it's the same rules, you know, defensive violence in, um, you know, in a reasonable, at a reasonable level, right? <laughs> proportional level, perhaps, uh, is totally justified. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I he, just, uh, I couldn't believe him. I couldn't believe it listening to him. And he's just like, oh, this doesn't apply to kids. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish, I wish if he was going to say that, that he would have at least gone on to explain when it does apply. You know, that's that's a really good point. Because like I said, you know, in in the ethics of liberty, at least, you know, like I said, I don't remember the exact passage, but Rothbard, I seem, I seem to recall his answer was as soon as they ask for the non-aggression principle to apply to them, that's when it finally does. I mean, I don't think he was talking specifically about the non-aggression principle, but he was basically like, how do you know when your kids are able to fend for themselves kind of thing? You know, that that doesn't – that's another place where Rothbard falls short for me because um, – so basically – you know, by that, that's the standard that we're going by. All I, you know, and if I want to enslave my kid, then uh, all I have to do is keep him ignorant of the existence of the non-aggression principle. Yeah, uh, the, you know, the whole part, the whole part for me about you being a trustee and that relationship and how you know when it ends, it, it, it all fell short for me as well. I, I mean, I don't really have a better answer than what he came up with, but in my defense, I haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about it either. <laughs> yeah. That's why when when I see people, you know, who are like all gung ho on Rothbard and they're like, yeah, the answer is Rothbard, you know, and I'm like, dude, I mean, come on. I mean, Rothbard is pretty moderate. He's pretty milk toasty. Uh, I mean, there's a lot better than him out there. You know, I'm sorry, Rothbard fans, but uh, amp it up, man. Like who? Like who? For example, Robert Murphy. Uh, who works at uh, the Mises Institute, wrote yeah. a book called uh, Chaos Theory. And there's a chapter in there on private law. And uh, basically, you know, Rothbard was kind of um, interested in having uh, one, you know, definitive source of law or, or document, not, not unlike the Constitution. Is um, that true? That's what I understood. And, so, I mean, I, and Murphy's, not, Murphy's vision is entirely decentralized. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna. I I haven't read Roth or I haven't read Murray's uh, Murphy's book, but I mean Rothbard is the he's the. Um, I guess the article I read, you know, I read a, I used to read a lot of the Lou Rockwell articles. You know, he pu- publishes like a dozen articles a day, mm-hmm. um, and there was one on there that had been excerpted from somewhere, but it was by Rothbard, and he was actually the one who introduced me into the idea of private arbitration, how that would work um, in criminal cases. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess that article didn't talk about the source of the law or where that came from, but I got the sense that from reading that that he it was it was he was talking about a private law society, not a constitution like what you're suggesting he had he had suggested. What I understand as to what he proposed, and it's been a while since I read this, um, so maybe the Rothbard fans can uh, call in and, and correct me, but. Um, was he wanted like a like a hybrid system where there was some kind of constitution, but there was also um, you know other sources you know contracts of course 
Um, right. You know, but it was that that hybrid that was kind of like you know, I mean, he he's better than Rand, who was um, you know a little bit before him, just tiny, a tiny bit ahead of him, or older than him, I should say. Um, who was all minarchist. I mean, everything, she got everything. I mean, even up to Ragnar Danisk Jold going out there and seizing stolen property. <laughs> um, but she was still minarchist. So at least he made the jump to anarchism. But it was all kind of like hybridy and milk toasty. And, you know, um, it just doesn't work for me. Rothbard is old. I mean, you've <laughs> got to give him props. Um, but still. Yeah, I, I I've enjoyed reading his stuff because it's very it's very accessible. It's not very academic. Um, I started out trying to read Mises, and his stuff is just so dense. Like I don't know if you've ever tried to read Mises stuff. No, but I have a hard time reading it. Um, and but Rothbard for me is just a whole lot easier to read. Uh, yeah, it he doesn't... explains everything a lot better. Yeah, so that's just where I got my start at. Yeah, all the all the the, the guys who are all gung ho on the on Mises and all that stuff. It's like. You know, for me, um, I just wonder, are you guys like escaping, trying to escape from the present world? I mean, you don't ha- – I mean, I went to the University of Chicago and I, I read all kinds of classics. I mean, it's the hardcore classics university. Uh, and so like I'm not opposed to going back and reading guys from from the past and history and all that stuff. I mean, that that's good. But I mean like when you make it your obsession to be like, you know, Mises was right and Hup is this and then, you know, I'm like – all right, but you know we live in the present world where there's all kinds of stuff going on, and you don't have to be like a Mises expert to understand, uh, you know, what's going on and how to fix it. And you know, so and I found like people get lost in their books and they forget that we live in in a world where there is a pressing problem, and people need to step up and do something about it. Does that make any sense? Well, it does. Well, are you talking about some problem in particular? Well, yeah, the problem of statism, the problem of statism. Yeah. I mean, we need, we need to get it under control. We need to, you know, I mean, we need to, to study obviously, but we need to be like, okay, now I've studied enough. I'm going to start putting into practice what I've learned. You know, I'm not going to stop studying, but I'm going to start putting it into practice. And I find there's a certain class of people, uh, quite numerous who never get out of the studying phase. So this this transitions into I, I I think we're gonna run way over on time this time I think well, we're already I think we like, should yeah I think we should probably wrap wrap it up for this week and save the other topic well, for next because we're at forty well, three minutes yeah I was gonna say I think though um I don't think we actually even got to the selfishness part we spent so much time <laughs> talking about kids <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was going to try and transition us into that to talk about that for a few minutes, but yeah, maybe we should just save it for a whole another episode. Yeah. Well, there's one other thing that Block said that I found ridiculous. He okay, talked about a, a th- his uh, three and a, uh, I don't know if it was his son or uh, an imaginary one, but a three and a half. Oh no, it was Mike Shanklin talked about his son who's three and a half months old. And right. so Block grabbed onto that to use as an example. He's like, you know, yeah, Mike, if your three and a half year old son is crawling into traffic, I mean, you got to go out there and get him. And I was like, you know, that that for me, like, totally like stripped away all his credibility because a three and a half month old kid is not capable of um of crawling. I don't think he's. I don't think it's even capable of crawling yet. But even no, if but it's, what blocks blocks point is basically that the fact that you go grab your kid justifies the use of force against your child. Ye- I mean, is that that the point he was making? Something like that. But he, I mean, but he was basically saying, you know, it's an emergency situation, and so you have to use aggression to save the kid. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's fail on so many levels. But the whole thing, it's just so he takes. It's such a red herring to say. Because what he's trying to say is the three and a half month old is not capable of communication or reasoning, so it's an emergency situation, right? Your your emergency measures, you know, it's a state of emergency, yeah. uh, and 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 he's crawling out into traffic, and so you're even more justified in doing whatever it takes, you know, and so it's just so insane because a three and a half month old child is not crawling, not e- and certainly not crawling out into traffic. I mean, they're just not capable of that at that age. It's such a red herring. It was so ridiculous. Well, okay, so let's say the child's six months old then. I mean, my daughter started crawling at six months, but she's got probably about the same mental capacity, at least as far as reasoning whether or not force is being used against her and asking for it to stop. I mean, 
I don't know the fact that he said three months versus six months is a disqualifying factor here. But even at six months, okay, so a six-month-old child crawling into a traffic, all right? The first thing I think is I've seen that in the movies, <laughs> um, and that's still patently ridiculous because what six-year-old child is going to be crawling into traffic? Well, yeah, I, I just what, don't see that. What you know, maybe if you want to talk about it. That you- <laughs> yeah, well, maybe an eighteen an eighteen month old child. Yeah, yeah. But but um, beyond beyond that, let me relate a little anecdote. When uh, when I knew that my son was going to be born, I was investigating you know all different kinds of things, and I came across this. I forget what it's called, but basically, it's where you learn you use basic sign language to communicate with your your baby. Uh, right. We did they, that with our son. Oh, really? Yeah, cool. just a little bit. Yeah, we did it just a little bit as well. And basically, uh, and this was a revelation to me and maybe to some of our listeners that you actually can communicate with your child uh, using sign language before they reach the ability to speak. And oh, yeah. so, yeah, and so one of the things that um, uh, uh, we taught uh, Clark was uh, the sign for, e- for eating more, uh, you know, that he wanted more to eat. And he right. was using that early on. And I, I specifically remember around uh, six or eight months, you know, my memory may be fuzzy, but it was definitely bef- right around or before the year mark, um, teaching him like, um, you know, I'm dad, that's mom. And I could see that, um, you know, there. I mean, kids are not animals. I mean, I could see that he was understanding something there and he thought it was funny. And he often thought it was funny that we were using sign language to communicate with him. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and there are, I've read studies where, um, you know, the kids are capable, babies even, you know, are capable of a whole lot more uh, than you might think. And there are even parents who have taught their kids to sign before, even at very young ages, to sign before they have to move their bowels. And so they don't use diapers. Uh, and they just wow. take the kid to the to the bathroom, and out comes the poop. Uh, wow! Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got friends who teach their kids sign language, and uh-huh. I'm always amazed when they teach them at like eight or nine months because we didn't. We just, you know, we weren't interested in doing it, and we only did it with our son because he didn't talk till he was almost three. Well, wow. so somewhere around two, we actually taught him. But I've seen parents teach them, you know, like you're saying, before a year. Uh huh. And it worked. And it worked well. It works well, and I'm always amazed by it. I'm like, how did they do that? You know, my daughter's still not talking at 18 months, but she's not really picking up the sign language a whole lot yet either. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, I'm always amazed when I see um, parents who've taught their kids sign language before they're even a year old. Yeah, we we think that the kids are basically um, kind of dumb animals, you know, until they reach a, a certain level, and even. A lot of people treat teenagers like, um, you know, fifth Dumb class animals. citizens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the reality is that, um, you know, we need to give them a whole lot more credit than that. Yeah. And, and, yeah, the, the and most, I think, I think go that goes back to the point you were making earlier that, you know, if you treat your kids, if you treat your kids as first class citizens, they'll respond that way and they'll yes. treat other people that way. Yes. You know, it seems like that's that's a big problem. You know, if you don't – and I t- constantly tell my wife, you know, let's give our son a little more responsibility. Like let's let him try this on his own. You know, even if he fails, at least he's going to learn to do it on his own. You know, he's not – You my it, in my experience, you learn a lot better by doing on your own and failing than by telling having somebody tell you how to do it. Amen. Amen. So I've, I'm constantly telling her, you know, let's let him try and do this thing. You know, and like you said, one, it boosts his self confidence because he does it by himself. I mean, I can't tell you what a great feeling it is when he does it and then screams out, "I did it!" You know, he's got this huge <laughs> smile on his face. So I mean, it's rewarding for me even too. You know, it certainly takes a lot more patience um, to let him do it himself. You know, takes him you know ten minutes or whatever to tie his shoes, kind of thing. But just when he gets it, it's it's so awesome to see that, you know, that look on his face of of satisfaction that he accomplished it all on his own. Isn't it? Yeah. I, I've seen that as well. That's pretty amazing. And you know, let's the and you know, raising kids right can be a part of one's liberty activism because uh, you know, if you know, we should definitely try our best to to do what we can in our lifetimes. But um, you know, when when we're gone if we have failed, if we have failed, then the children must carry on. And um, they're ne- going to need to carry the um, the concept of liberty from birth. 
in order to be successful. And if we are successful in our lifetime, well, they're going to be the ones who sustain it into the next generation. And so it is absolutely vital if you care about liberty, uh, dear listener, that you give and that you're, if you have children or are thinking of having children, that you give a lot of thought to this. Because uh, it is absolutely essential for uh, the implementation of uh, libertarian values. Yeah, I've, I've long said that's true. I mean, we were talking earlier about conservatives who just want to, you know, remove these Occupy people um, mm-hmm. from wherever they are just because they're breaking whatever law that is. I mean, to, I think those people, by and large, are just unreachable. You're not going to convince them of libertarianism um, how hard, however hard you try. And so I've long said, I think, you know, I, I hate to say the old cliche, use the old cliche that children are our future, but it's kind of true here, in my opinion. Well, I think uh, I have two comments on that. First, that can be seen as a cop out. <laughs> and second, um, we don't have to convince, we don't have, have to make everybody a uh, Rothbardian or radical libertarian in order uh, to achieve greater liberty and respect for life in our lifetimes. We only, we only have to achieve a critical mass and neutralize, silence uh, the rest of the people. Or, you know, get them to some state where they're not actively fighting us, um, which is not necessarily, you know, a, a bad thing or an aggressive thing, just where they're kind of like tired of hearing us <laughs> and they don't have any good rebuttals anymore. And they're like, all right, give it a chance, give it a try, you know, that kind of attitude. Yeah. Or even well, think- just passive, because you know what? 80% of the population or more are just passive. Right. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think we got to leave this here and just make the next episode part two of this. <laughs> okay. I mean, we're way over on time. I hate to cut you off, but you know, like we had a whole second half of stuff we didn't even get to here. So, yeah, I think it was a good, uh, really good conversation. And the uh, the and we even we didn't even have to use the most what is it sensationalistic part of uh of block's comments because at the end there of the first 10 minutes of that video he was talking about scenarios where you would have to uh he or mike or whoever it is certainly not me where someone might have to rape their child in order to save their lives oh yeah i do oh, i've forgotten all about Look at that. that we did a whole episode without even having to bring in that complete nonsense in order to have something to talk about yeah, wow. I yeah. totally forgotten about that. We should definitely pat ourselves on the back. But that that, that was <laughs> that was that was just insane. So yeah, anyway, dear listener, um we would love to have your comments and questions at 641-715-3900 extension 255-888. And uh, you can also find that number at AYMFL, those are the initials for arm your mind for liberty, dot com slash T A O L. Uh, and those are the initials for the art of liberty. Um, any parting comments, John? No, we're way over on time. I'm not going to waste anybody else's time out there. <laughs> we're not wasting time. These are nuggets of delicious wisdom falling from our lips. <laughs> not my lips. Maybe yours. You're a smart guy, but not me. Uh, don't underestimate yourself, John. <laughs> don't underestimate yourself. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening, and have a great week.